Good morning, church. Welcome to our time of gathered worship. Hope you had a Merry Christmas with your family. And today is one of the last gatherings, if not the last gathering of the year together. <laughs> As we look forward to 2022, can you believe it? Um, what a year or two it's been going through COVID as we all have, and many of us have had direct family impacted by that, and just the incredible stress of going through a, a global pandemic. One of the things that has helped our family get through it, and I know it has yours, is remembering the promises of God. His promises are sure even when the world around us just seems to be going crazy, and when our families are going crazy. So as we begin our time today, and even in the few songs that we'll sing today and the word of God that we'll look at together, uh, let's have our hearts open and submissive to God and the leading of his spirit so that he would convict us and challenge us to trust him uh, in this new year ahead. Let's stand together. And I'll begin with this call to worship God. It's a wonderful, wonderful promises that we're about to read. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. Yeah, amen. Um, this song, 10,000 Reasons, is uh, somewhat new still, but I, I pray that the words um, really paint a picture for you to, uh, for daily things to trace God's promises, like the sun coming up every day. When we see that, as sure as the sun comes up every day, we can trust that God's promises are sure. And um, I, I just pray that the song will bless you today as we bless the Lord in song. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up it's a new day dawning it's time to sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. in love and you're slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my 
is glorious. By his word, the universe was spoken into being. His perfect plan unfolds before us each day. May we have eyes to see. God is gracious. God is great. With his death on the cross, mankind has been redeemed. May we have new ears to hear the story every day. God is good. When we ask forgiveness, he draws us back to himself as a good shepherd gathers his sheep. May we know his presence in our lives today. As we sing, and speak with one another the gospel truth of his death and resurrection. May we be witnesses to each other and to the glory of our Lord. Amen. Amen. The song, Come You Sinners, uh, is older compared to the last one we just sang. Um, for those of you who love history and hymns, uh, this was written by Joseph Hart in 1759. Now, if I'm right, that's older than most of us here today. So this is truly one of the traditional hymns. <laughs> when I think of traditional hymns, I often think of things that have to be at least in the 1800s or, or older. Um, and this is, a, this is a wonderful song. There may be some older ways of saying things, like the last line of the chorus where it says, in the arms of my great Savior, there are 10,000 charms. Don't think of magical lucky charms. <laughs> but dazzling, glorious beauty and attributes of God, his holiness, his majesty, his faithfulness, his wisdom, his compassion, all of these things are what we're, we should be thinking about when we sing this. Well, let's sing together. sinners poor and needy weak and wounded sick and sore Jesus ready stands to save you full of pity love and power Go to the next slide, verse 2. Yeah. Come ye thirsty, come and welcome God's free bounty glorify true belief and true repentance every grace that brings you now Arms. 
charms Come ye weary heavy laden lost and ruined by the fall if you tarry until you're better you will never come at all i will arise and go to jesus he will embrace me in his arms in the arms of my dear savior be seated and go in prayer with that confidence that we have in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, what we just sang is so good for us, and it's so important for our souls to be able to remember that, because today may not feel that way at all. Today may feel like we are alone. Today might feel like people don't care. Today, things may go our way, but for a lot of us, there may be some parts where things just don't go right. And God, you know I've had that feeling this morning. It's so good to know, to be reminded that you are with us, and you are for us, and that you love us. And the way that things go whether we find them pleasant or not, are not a good indicator of the truth of who you are and how you love and how loved we really are. So Lord, today, I just pray for us. I just ask for help to be able to turn to you and find out that there's so much more to who you are and so much more to all that you can do and so much more to your perfection, so much more to your faithfulness, and so much more, God. When we ask you for help, you don't ignore us. You're not distracted. You're not discouraged. I just pray you would help us with that. Lord, I pray that for uh, Patty Jean and for Bob. Thank you that Pat's continuing to heal. I know that... um, they need your, your strength and your help. Lord, I, I, I thank you that that's true in every way for Vicki today. Lord, she said it was okay to mention that her mom passed away yesterday. And Lord, I know that today she needs to know that she can turn to you. That that you love her and that you are with her. And Lord, she just needs to know your comfort even today as she drives over to see her dad. We just ask that you be with her. And Lord, we pray the same things. Uh, Little Charlotte, Ray, Lord, uh, I thank you so much for, for this little, brave, feisty little girl. And for her parents, and for all the family. Again, thank you for continuing to take care. This little girl that they said that 
couldn't survive being born has now lived for three months. And we just ask that you would continue to be there. And Lord, I pray for those whose you know, marriages right now are, are, are broken or falling apart and those who maybe their, <clears throat> their situations, maybe their cars don't run or their houses are, are, are drafty or Lord, just things that we run into. I pray you would help us to remember, God, that we can come to you and that your heart is just bent to want to help. So encourage us, help us to trust you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's great to get to connect with you today. Thanks so much for for being here. Uh, I want to give you a couple announcements. Um, One thing that I want to mention to you is that Patty Jean asked me to make sure that I told all of you Merry Christmas and that she loves you all, and she's so thankful that you've been praying for her. So continue to pray for Bob and for Pat. Um, This is the longest that they've been separated in their lives uh, since they've been married. But uh, it seems like things are progressing. Uh, So she she likes uh, St. Joe's where she's at right now and her rehabilitation, but just keep praying for them. Uh, As I mentioned during prayer, Vic... uh, Vicki Norris got in touch with me yesterday, and she said that her mom passed yesterday. So you can imagine the challenge um, now and for the future. I'll pray for her. It, it wasn't unexpected, um, and uh, she just really is grateful for all of you. Again, praying for her, encouraging her, uh, send some cards or some love uh, would be a really great thing that you could do for her right now. And she's on her, she's driving over from uh, her brother's house to go uh, spend some time with her dad today. So just pray for her in the middle of that um, uh, as well. Okay. Um, and then uh, we keep mentioning little Charlotte and her mom, Laura, and this is uh, Charlie and Patsy's great granddaughter. So uh, this special little girl who's born with what, when I was growing up, we called it brittle bone disease. Uh, But again, she was told by doctors that she would not survive and that they should abort. And uh, these uh, parents trusted God and God has just supplied all the right specialists and all the right people. And now this feisty little girl uh, is three months old. And they say that in the future, she could even walk. They say that they expect uh, her to be able potentially to live a a normal, say, lifespan. So praise God for that. But pray for them because you know that in every step of this, this is not easy. (laughs) You know, if you you want easy, uh, you would not pursue this. But her life is so precious to God and to her parents. And uh, so I I think that's another beautiful thing that I just would love to just encourage you to keep uh, praying for, um, for them. Uh, other things, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that we pass on to you. Um, but, uh, you know, a couple announcements that I just want to make sure get to you is do we, are we doing children's church? I don't know if we have any kids that need. Okay. So there you go. So there is children church. So if you didn't make it today, uh, but we are planning on having that every week. So uh, for parents, more consistency, again, we can, we can have that. We don't have to wonder which week. We'll also have Salt and Light this week. That's our youth ministry. So we are definitely uh, planning to uh, take care of that and enjoy getting together with them. Um, I know that uh, I just saw a note from Joel, and he was wondering if, um, uh, wondering if we should have prayer this week. Right now, we're going to say this uh, Saturday morning, we'll still have prayer together. But if you have an input and you want to be part of that, uh, let us know. We know that that's New Year's morning and, and all that kind of stuff, right? Is that what we're thinking, Joel? Well, we're going to be real family awkward and know that it's a small core group and everyone who comes is in this room right now. Yes. So let's find out, should we have prayer group after? Because I know that Irish are going to have like Mindy and those kids over Mm. Friday night. Okay. Friday night yep. So I guess, is it worth it? Is it awkward or should we communicate? 
Well, uh, how about anybody who, who's planning on being there Saturday morning at 8 a.m. for prayer? Every month we take time to uh, pray at 8 a.m. And I uh, just kind of want to know because we either can, can move forward with it or not. So I see Diane's hand. I could also do other weekends. So okay. Move it a week is fine. Let's... Move to the, you represent your family. Thank you, Benjamin. I appreciate that. He is the he volunteers as tribute. Um, well, what if we looked at the eighth instead of the first? And that way, for those parents who are doing stuff and, and enjoying time with their families and kids. So we're going to say prayer is going to be January 8th, but you can certainly get up and pray on January 1st. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's January 8th will be our prayer meeting here uh, at 8 a.m. Uh, instead of January 1st, okay? So that, those are my um, announcements, except, you know, I had to bring up a little housekeeping thing here. Uh, Patsy and I were talking about clothing choices today, and, and um, uh, I was going to check with Patsy because, you know, Charlie had thought about wearing jeans today, and he said, well, the pastor wears them. And, and, you know, uh, he got outvoted, which is wise. But, you know, I got outvoted today, too, because uh, yesterday for Christmas, Santa Claus happened to bring me a kilt. <laughs> so, Patsy, what we could do is Charlie and I could work together on, on the, would, would the kilt side of things work? Because my wife outvoted me, and she said that it would not be good. She said, I don't want to be the only one employed in our family, because she, <laughs> I mean, when you see these legs, though, these little chicken legs, they would, you guys would just think, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> so I did wear, you know, there, there are pictures on Facebook in case you need to see being a kilt, but I have promised Santa Claus brought me this wonderful kilt because I have threatened my daughter so many times. I'm going to show up on her college campus for one of her games. <laughs> wearing a kilt. It would, it, would, it would be good. So who knows? All sorts of uh, fashion choices are out here. Uh, at least I could say this, nobody would be distracted by my beard anymore. All right? So <laughs> some, sometimes you got to give them something else to some other place to go <laughs> in this. Were you raising your hand, Tracy? Oh, oh she's going to change the topic. <laughs> Mm. And it happens very rarely for them to see Taya because she lives in the other on the west coast. So just pray for safe travel. It's just a really special time yeah. for them and her. Okay. It's, it's hard to be that far away as a grandparent when we see them hurt like a couple times a year. And so many of you guys know what that's like. Absolutely. So we will. We'll pray for them. Awesome. Well, let's take our Bibles and we're going to look at Luke chapter 11. And um, in Luke chapter 11, uh, what I want to talk to you about is pursuing God in prayer in 2022. All right, so that is our, that is our topic today, Luke chapter 11. I want to go ahead and read to you uh, Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. And um, so if you have your Bible, you'll want to turn there with me. And this is about the Lord's Prayer, so it gives us a model for prayer. But I also think I would like to emphasize to you today the reasons why, again, you know, almost every year we try to challenge ourselves, remind ourselves that we need to be people of prayer. So Luke chapter 11, 1 through 13. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place and he finished. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Father... Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, loan me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. 
Verse 7, and he will answer him from, in, from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut. My children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, <clears throat> yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Verse 9, and I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead, instead of a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more Will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So this is the word of the Lord. Amen. I need this. One of the hard, I think one of the things that's really maybe hard about maybe being a pastor, there, there's so many joys, there's so many uh, gifts that we get to do, there's so many flexibilities. One of the hardest things is when you pick something that you're going to preach on, and then the Lord reminds you why you need that. All right, so this morning has been one of those mornings. I have, I have not felt like God is this close, near, I'm right there by your side. Instead, I have felt very much the opposite. First, um, we call it nuisance snow. I don't know about you guys, but it's nuisance snow, because if I don't clean up all that snow and take care of it, my driveway will then turn to ice, and I will have to live with ice for the next three months. So every time it snows, so I was out last night at 11 o'clock, snow blowing the driveway, trying to clean things up, and I wake up this morning, and what do I find? The perfect amount of nuisance snow. It's just enough to bother me, and I have to get out there, and I have to go out and clean it up. And when I do this, do I feel really loved? I can tell you I do not. I do not feel loved. I do not feel, oh, the wonder of the snowy season. That, that's not what's going through my mind. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm out there doing that, and then I go ahead and I decide I'm going to start my car, let it warm up a little bit. Guess what wouldn't start today? Now, how many times have my cars started? They've started all the time. Now, in the middle of all this, uh, we've had some great visits with, with uh, my sister is up. My wonderful sister Nancy is here, and her husband Kevin, and her, her children, and you know we're just so grateful to get to spend time with them. Uh, but I haven't gotten a lot of sleep. That doesn't help a whole lot, right? And then today I'm trying to cook uh, something, some smoking, some pork, so that we can have lunch together. But that meant I had to stay up until past midnight to be able to put the pork on, and because uh, you got to time things out so that it'll be ready on time today. Uh, so not a ton of sleep and, and I put all that together. <clears throat> so when I'm out shoveling, I feel deeply loved. I feel, I feel like God is just right there with me. And I feel like I have this great loving dad, right? No, I, I'm telling myself that I feel absolutely alone and like nobody else wants to help me and that this all falls on my shoulders. And it doesn't flow from this place of going, well, it's because I'm so deeply loved and known and cared for. It's generally sitting there saying, I feel like a failure. I feel like I haven't done things well enough. I feel like I have no help in this. And I feel like I'm on my own. And I, and I figured I probably would not be the only one that feels that way, even today, no matter what gifts maybe you got yesterday. So that's why we need to come back to this. So, so what we sang today and what we said today when we reminded ourselves that God is good and great and gracious and glorious, we need that. I, I need that. I need this passage. So what I want to do is just, I want to preach to myself, and I'm going to let you guys listen to me. You know, have you ever heard somebody talk to themselves, and they're really not talking to you, they're just talking to themselves? In one sense, I'm going to preach this sermon to my soul, because my soul needs this. And yet, I figure that, like Bill so bravely said, we're not alone in this. 
I think all of us need this. So what I want to do is remind us of some really important truths today. All right, and I'll try to do it efficiently. Um, So let me start out by saying this. First, we need to remember what we were made for. Not, what do my circumstances look like? Not, do I feel like I have money in the bank? Not, did people think that my kilt yesterday looked wonderful or not? (laughs) I did wear it all day. Uh, I was trying to break Tracy in on it, but it still didn't win her over on it. So, uh, you know, um, not, did I get the present that I wanted? Not, even, did the kids get along or did they bicker and argue? Bicker was my dad's favorite word. Um, so, you know, the, not, not those things. What, not our circumstances, what were we made for? I want to remind you this. As we walk into 2022, and I don't know if you've seen this meme, but there's a little meme out there that says, okay, 2022 is either 20. Two, two, or it's 2020 kind of again, 2022, uh, the second version of 2020. We know that this has been a challenging couple of years, just a strange, weird type of year. As we go into 2022, I want to remind us of the one purpose for which we live and the purpose above all purposes for every human that has ever existed, no matter where they live, no matter what time they have ever lived in, what age, what stage, whether they knew what a smartphone was, or if they've never heard of such a thing. All of us were created to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Do you remember that today? Because my heart was not starting there. I did not get out of bed this morning and say, I was made to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. I know it's hard to believe, Scott, but that's, that's really where I was. Jeremiah 9, verses uh, 23 through 24, uh, they, it says this. Let me get there. Jeremiah 9. Um, 23 through 34. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. We were made to know and find our life and our definition and our approval and our acceptance in who God is. The 10,000 charms, to find out that God is so multi-layered that we could explore Him for the rest of eternity and never even scratch the surface of all of His beauty and perfections, things that when we get to see them lived out in him, we would literally just kind of, it would take our breath away. Our joy is God himself above all things. So here, here's why that means, makes a difference for us. Um, when we talk about the gospel, we talk about good news. When we talk about the message that God gave to us, it's not as small as, though it includes these things, it's not as small as just me not going to hell. Though that is part of the gospel. It, it's not as small as the fact that there's a day coming where there will no longer be sin or sickness or pain or death even though those are part of it. It's not so much that when I get to go to heaven, I get to enjoy my favorite leisure activities. Um, It's more than that. It's not even just that I will get to see my family or friends again. It's not even just the absence of COVID or conflict or taxes or cars that won't start. It's more than that. Those are some of the ramifications of the gospel, but the gospel is that we get God. 
We can understand then, here's, here's one of the things that we need to understand, is that we can, someone can actually understand, they can believe, they can actually rejoice in all of the true and precious acts, aspects of the gospel, and they can actually miss its greatest good. So I'm here to remind you of a phrase that we've used so many times before, that Jesus is better than anything that life can give or death can take away. Jesus is better than anything that life can give to us or death can take away. But I'm also admitting on mornings when our cars don't start, and on mornings when uh, there's snow, and that's how petty I am, all right? That just shows you like the level. My, there, there's so many people that are going through so much harder than this. But in that moment, just because of the snow, because of being tired, because my car won't start, I can actually get to the point where I realize, hey, this is a big fight in my life. Because I will either live to get to know God and enjoy Him, Or, I will live for my comfort. For what I think is best. It's going to come down to a fight. It's going to come down to an everyday having to return, recalibrate, retune my heart so that it fits properly there. So, If that's the truth, if that's what we're made for, the second thing I wanted to say is, well, then how do we get there? Because if it takes one little snow and one car that won't start to get me completely off track during my week, and and, and I have the privilege of being able to spend time in God's Word and spend time with God's people every day, I'm assuming some other people in here probably can also struggle. So how do we stay on track? Well, I want to say this, one of our most necessary weapons for that fight is prayer. We need the Word of God, and we need that Word of God supernaturally empowered and enlivened by the Holy Spirit, and we need that that Word to be brought to us by other Christians, other people who believe this, and and we also need to live out the mission of God um, to, to share this good news with other people. Um, all of these things are necessary elements of faith. But my goal today is to say, please do not miss out on the role of prayer. Let's make one of our defining characteristics this year as a church that we will be a people of prayer. And that's why we read Luke chapter 11, uh, 1 through 13. Uh, Let me just point this out to you real quickly. Where does Luke 11, 1 through 13 start out? It starts with Jesus praying. Isn't that interesting? Because here we are talking about the Lord's Prayer. And where do we find Jesus? Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place. Why would Jesus pray? I mean, one of the things that stands out to us is Jesus doesn't just tell us to pray. Jesus prayed. And in fact, if you go through the book of Luke, which we did a few years ago, you'll notice that the prayer of life of Jesus was huge for Luke. Luke actually records Jesus praying nine times, more than any other gospel. Paul Miller writes in his book, A Praying Life, Jesus is without question the most dependent human being who ever lived. Jesus could not do life on his own. So he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. That could be the end of the sermon, right? Because if you want to sit there and go, man, what am I going to have to do? I should look at Jesus and I should sit there and go, man, if Jesus, who was absolutely perfect in every single way, who never sinned and had none of the mess that goes on inside of my life, if he needed to pray, then I need to pray. That, that could be the whole thing right there, right? Let me just give you a couple observations on this passage. The first thing I want you to see when we look at this is assume that your life is going to be messy. Our lives are not together. Uh, What what do we see this in? Well, verse 6, when he's using this kind of illustration, imagine running out of bread when you had a whole bunch of company coming over. 
Now, none of us would ever do it, right? None of us would ever get close on maybe how much propane we have in our tank when all the family's coming over. None of us would ever sit there and go, oh, you know what? There's not enough food. I ran out or I forgot to pick something up. What, what I guess what we can look at this passage is Jesus tells this, this parable, because what's he doing? He's encouraging us to pray. You should read this and go, man, I want to pray. I feel like I could ask God to help me with my car today. I, ask God, I could actually ask God to help me with this nuisance snow today. I could ask God to help me not be so grumpy today. I could ask God for anything in here. Only if you're messy. If you got all your stuff together, guess what? You won't need to pray. If you feel like you can handle it, if you feel like you can do it, if you feel like you have lists and you're organized and that you are better than other people, you will not need to pray. But what Jesus is definitely pointing out here is we need to be real. We need to be transparent failures who do not have it all together. And yet, if I were to say that, how many of us can sit there and go, I do not have it all together? I think all of us could probably raise our hand. A couple of you guys are like, yes, amen, preach that. That's me. I know exactly what you're talking. But then the second thing that you can see in this passage is in verses six through eight, right? Um, how, many, how, many, how many of you guys have kids? Okay. How, how do kids, I have a daughter, all right? <laughs> And one of the things I love about her is probably even more than Mark, Caitlin is not afraid to ask for anything that she wants in the world. And she somehow believes that we're actually going to get it for her. Uh, but she just has no problem sitting there going, Dad, I need you to help me do this today. And, and she asks like a child. All right. And that's because she is my child. And she knows that I'm actually really bent towards saying, you know what? I love to help you with that. Uh, we've got project. We've got a woodworking project we have to work on. And we haven't gotten to it yet. But we have this woodworking project that we have to work on. And, and she doesn't mind at all asking me to give up my time to help her do this because she wants to make a nice gift for somebody else. But don't you see that in this passage? How, where, where do you see it? Well, at midnight. Right? I mean, parents, don't, don't your kids, aren't they like unashamed to come to you at midnight? Mom! <laughs> what? I'm thirsty. <laughs> well, go get a drink. Can you bring it to me? That's the sense of this passage, isn't it? We're asking like children at midnight. This guy's showing up at his neighbor's house saying, I forgot to have any bread to feed my neighbors. Dude, get out of bed and help me. That's asking. This has to be this guy's kid, right? I mean, he's going to his dad's house to say, Dad, can I borrow the car? I mean, wh whatever is going on in this situation, and he's not asking because he deserves it. You owe me three loaves of bread. Or you said you contracted that you would give me these bread. He just shows up undeserving. And that actually points to the next one. Because it's not only asking like children, it's believing like children. They actually think we want to help them, people. If you've got little people that live in your house, I guess grandchildren are probably exactly the same on this, right? They actually believe that you want to help them. Why? Because you do. <laughs> Scott, Scott tries to change their mind. <laughs> you don't really want that. <laughs> Let's see, what do I have in my pocket? Don't you want this? You know, but but they they don't just ask like children; they believe like children. We trust the one who gives it to us. They 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 show up empty-handed. <laughs> they don't even bring a plate when they're asking for some food. They just show up like. Aren't you going to get all this for me? But I will tell you this. Um, in verses 11 and 12, you can kind of see this. Um, it's not about technique even, is it, right? What father among you, when his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks you for an egg, will give him a scorpion? 
If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? They believe like children. So let's remind ourselves. Assume that your life is messy and that you need help. Check. All right? Ask like you're a child. Ask like your kids might ask you or like you picture someone's kids might ask them. And put yourself as young as possible in there. Because again, you know, when, when we think we're teenagers, we're like, well, I should take care of this myself. But when we're little kids, we just ask mom or dad to do these things for us. Assume messy, ask like children, believe like children. Believe that God really wants to help you. And isn't it interesting, though, the reward is the Holy Spirit's presence because he doesn't say God's going to give you a bunch of eggs or God's going to give you a bunch of bread. What he says is that, that God is going to give them the presence of the Holy Spirit, his presence, to be with you when you have to clear nuisance snow. Our reward is the Holy Spirit's presence and empowerment. It's no coincidence that the reward of persistent prayer here is that God gives the Holy Spirit because the Spirit, with the Spirit comes the power that we need to fight the fight of faith. With the Spirit comes the ability to trust what God has promised. And then with that comes the empowerment to actually live like family. Right? That's one of our qualifiers. That's one of our, our, our goals. It, with the Spirit comes the ability to actually live on God's mission of seeing people from our community come to know Jesus. And with the Spirit comes the ability to actually live like servants. We can only and will only do this if we actually believe the good news of the gospel. That's our hope. So, two things I want to just remind you of before we hit the last point. What this does not mean, prayer is not the way to earn God's approval. So if you show up on the 8th at 8, and you come to pray, you don't come to pray because that's how God's going to say, okay, well now I owe you a new car. <laughs> that starts. <laughs> you know, that, that's not the purpose here. And you don't see that here. You don't see a technique when, when Jesus teaches them how to pray. He doesn't say, pray these magic incantation and God will have to do whatever you say to him. That's not what the Lord's Prayer is. So this is not how you earn God's approval. What it does mean, though, is um, prayer can't help but flow out of the heart that loves Jesus and what he's done. You can't help yourself but be somebody who sits there and goes, God, I need help. It all goes back to whether or not we find God to be our treasure, which is really the heart of Christianity. And that's why we so often say when we baptize people, have you found Jesus to be the forgiver and the leader and the treasure of your life? A really succinct way for us to say that. So now, how does all this help us? We, we, we talked about what the purpose for our lives, what we're made for, and then we talked about how prayer can, you know, what, how, how we can get there, how we can, how we can become people who love God that way. How will it help us? I guess that's when the rubber hits the road, when we think through life, what difference will this make? How would gospel-centered focus on prayer impact your living and praying. That's what I just want to kind of wrap up here. Well, when you find God to be your treasure, and then you come to Him in prayer this way, how does it make a difference when you get what you want, what you asked for, what you were hoping for? Well, Instead of me saying, oh, I really needed this, or this is going to finally fulfill my life, it's going to make me happy. Instead, what do I do? I sit there and go, God, you are such a good father. Thanks for providing. 
you know, uh, I'm sure it happened a lot yesterday. Sometimes it was probably mandated, but when, when we gave presents to others, what's the word that comes out of our hearts and our minds? Thank you. Maybe even a hug, right? I, I'm also saying that there's probably some times where we say to our kids, uh, make sure you say thank you. All right, we we have to do these kind of things. But instead of looking at it going, hey, I deserve a present like this, we look at it and we say, thank you for sacrificing. When we see God this way, prayer does not become a means to get what we want. Instead, we see that our Father really cares about us. And we love to give Him glory. So my power doesn't come from my technique. I don't look at it. Uh, All right, Christmas story movie with Ralphie wanting to get what? The Daisy Red Rider single act. I don't remember what the the whole thing was, but there's a whole thing, isn't there? And what's he really counting on throughout the whole movie? His technique. If he can write the essay, if he can somehow lay out this argument with his parents, if he can keep the magazine open to just the right place, guess what? He will get the Red Rider BB gun that he's always wanted. And how does that all work out for him? Horribly. But in the end, we know the story takes... I, I, is, it a, is it really... Am I breaking anything if I say the fact that he actually gets the gun, right? And how does he get the gun? Because his dad gives it to him. It's because his dad loved him. And then he shot his eye out. All right. So, <laughs> all right. Um, so when we go to prayer this way, what we come out of it is to say, wow, God, I really love you. Instead of saying, boy, I said things exactly right. Isn't that freeing? Because that means when you go to pray, you don't have to have any super technique or skill at all. You can just come like a kid in the middle of the night and tell them what you need. So how does it change us, though, when we don't get what we want? Because there will be a lot of things that we pray about and we say, God, it would be really great if suddenly I had a brand new car in my driveway. And God will probably say, yeah, You don't need that. How does it change it? Again, if I feel like this is all of my technique, I'm going to feel like what? I messed up something. I must have said the wrong word. I must have not had the right posture. I must have had pasta. And and for some reason that canceled out the prayer. So I, I can't I can't do that that way. But when we come to God because we really believe that uh, God is is good, we really believe um, what uh, Romans chapter eight verse uh, 11, thirty one. Um, says to us, right? Well, shall we say these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So I'm not going to sit there and say, God, I really didn't want snow today. Can you take the snow away? Instead, uh, and, and I'm going to say, well, I must not have pulled the right technique. Instead, I'm going to say, okay, God, I still believe that you are good. I still believe that you love me. And somehow, nuisance snow is part of that. (laughs) All right? And, And how does it change the way I pray for others? You know what? I think one of the biggest things it changes is if we come at this and we assume that we're messy... I am never amazed when I pray for other people. I don't ever have to be outraged. I don't ever have to be ashamed when I think about how they live their lives. I don't have to do any of these kind of things. Why? Because I'm so familiar with my own mess. I can pray for them. No judgment. No frustration. I can pray for them because I know how much of a mess I am. We need to pray. We need to pray because uh, of a couple of things. First, I was thinking through this. We need to pray as individuals, but we also need to pray in a group. 
This is why we, we say, hey, pray in your own closet, like find time, find a place and, and, and try to be intentional with that kind of prayer. If, if right now you pray when you're behind the steering wheel, why don't you look to add some time in the morning where you could have a little more concentrated time of prayer. Uh, let's, let's make it a thing that maybe we pray as a family, we pray as a couple. Let's, let's make it a thing though, to also gather together with God's people to pray. That's why we announce it every week, every month that we have this one time to pray. And we're looking to add in some other times on a Sunday morning, even during gathered worship to take time to pray because we need to pray as individuals, but we also need to pray as groups. Uh, second thing is we need to pray at specific times times as well at all as at all times. So when we set an 8 a.m. on the first Saturday of the month time to pray, we need specific times like that. But yes, when we went home for Christmas Eve, uh, we were driving up 85 and suddenly you see a bunch of headlights and there's a car in the ditch on the side and a bunch of people standing around to help. I need to be able to be flexible enough to just pray in that moment. We need God's help to live as family in in, in 2022. Especially so we don't become consumers. One of the things, one of the trends that I've, as I've talked to some of my pastor friends, is this pandemic has somewhat led people to uh, a little bit of a consumer mindset. Now, I've been really grateful as a church family, that I have not seen that here. But it has become a big issue for a lot of churches. If a pastor says anything about being vaccinated, he loses half his congregation. If a pastor says anything about being unvaccinated, he loses half of his congregation. When people look up and say, you have not supplied a nursery for me, (laughs) people leave. There's this part that could be dangerous for us. We need to pray so that we avoid living like consumers and instead we live like family. We need God's help to live out the very mission of his heart. Because the pandemic has actually opened doors for us to be able to talk to people about their long term, about their future, about what really matters, because this whole pandemic has robbed so many people of what they thought that would make their life complete. And it's, it's open doors. God's using this time. We've seen people come to know Jesus because they have stopped during this time. God wants us to be on mission. He wants us to share with others. We need to pray because we need supernatural power. We need unique enabling by the Holy Spirit to see many people from this region come to know Him. We need to pray because we need boldness and we need wisdom and we need words and we need lives that demonstrate how precious Jesus really is. Because I can say that Jesus is precious, but it's a whole other thing to actually have someone say, it's not just his words, it's his life that emphasizes that. But when I get you know, that upset as I did this morning about snow and a car won't start, that, that's not the transformed life. So I need help. Pray for me, because I need help. <laughs> All right? And I'm praying for you too. We, we need to pray because we need for God to make us servants. To the very least in our community. We need to be advocates for mercy and for justice. And we need to pray because we need God's help to learn more about Him. Our definition, your job, okay, as a church, we've been saying this for the last year, your job is to help others take one more step towards the light. You don't need to know everything. You don't need to do it for everybody. But when we go into our week, we sit there and go, okay, God, how can I help them take one more step? How can I help the grandkids take one more step towards you? 
How can I help this person who's known you and uh, loved you, but they're, they're really isolated? They don't feel loved and connected. God, what could I do to help them take one more step towards you? God, I need to eat, so I need to have somebody else over. Who could I have over, and how could that turn into a spot where we could let them take one more step towards you? It's a simple definition. And it's so simple it could actually escape us. That's the danger of it, right? We talked about our rhythms, and then the goal of our rhythms is to simply say, how can I help this person? We may not even go into the conversation knowing what we're supposed to do. It may be in the middle of it that we go, oh, God, thank you. Now I know how I can help them. Take one more step. We need to pray because we need God's help to learn more about Him so that we can help others take one more step towards the light. Disciples who know who He is and what He's done for us, people who love to study and people who love to grow, but also people who are learning about themselves and God giving us insights into where maybe sin or idolatry or other things have taken root. We need to pray. And it's God's joy to give us these things. He's a good dad. I hope most of all today, you're with me and you say, God really is good. I need to turn to him more often. And it doesn't sound like anything is silly. I want to ask him for more help. That would be a great way to start this next year. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, I just ask that you would help us not to, not to feel like you love kids who take care of themselves, not to feel like we're uh, a bother. God, I pray that instead you would help us to really continue to learn to love the fact that you are so powerful and present, that you're not distracted. I pray that you would go ahead and just open up our eyes and our hearts to be able to admit where we're a mess. I pray that we would just turn to you and lean into you and find that in you there are those 10,000 charms. As sinners we come. as children who need their dad. I just pray that you would just hardwire that into us and encourage us and help us today and the next day, all throughout the year. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for doing for us that was so much more than we could ever ask or hope or imagine. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing, There is a Redeemer. Spirit 
until the work on earth is done when i stand in glory i will see his face and there i'll serve my king forever in that holy place thank you oh my father for giving us your son and leaving your spirit till the work on earth is done thank you giving us your son and leaving your spirit till the work on earth is done. Amen. To Jesus Christ, who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom priests serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. God bless you.